Okay, uh, let's go, five, four. Okay, uh, I'm Ugo Ezema, and I'm the host of The Last Zebra. This is our episode four, and I have the honor of having Dr. Tanya Kohal as my fourth guest, and I'm really, really happy to have her here. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. First podcast, we kind of were just talking about First this. podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, I am one of Ugo's coworkers, mm -hmm. but gosh, from the beginning, I suppose when I introduced myself, I will start with, I was born outside the United States. Yeah. I'm actually a UK citizen still and an American citizen, but uh, moved when we were really young. I mean, my parents had immigrated from India in the 80s to the United Kingdom. We lived there. My brother and I both born there, moved all over the country, but I'd say I grew up in California, mm. went to high school, college out there, did all my medical training in Detroit and or around Detroit and Detroit and then came down to Louisiana for fellowship. And here I am. <laughs> Wait, I did not know the UK part. Yeah. Wow. Where in UK? We lived in Ashford, which is in that? Kent. Kent. Yeah. I wonder if I, is that... Because the UK is Ireland, Scotland, England, and isn't there two Wales. islands? And, and it's Wales. Northern Ireland. Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Northern Ireland. Where is Kent in all those countries? Is that England? It's in England, yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. okay, okay, okay. Oh, that's awesome. I did not know that. How old were you when you moved to California? I moved to California in 2001. Oh. Yeah. We lived in the suburbs of Detroit when we first moved. Mm. Cause you know, anytime you're an immigrant family, you're going to find your people. <laughs> you're going to go stay where they are. And then my mom actually matched residency Whoa. in Morgantown, West Virginia at WVU. So we all moved there. She's in neurosurgery residency. So we lived there for quite a while. That's amazing. And then moved out to California where a lot of our family is. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What was that? Where's your British accent? I don't have it. That's I like, wish I did. Although people tell me, they say you don't, you sound like certain words you say don't sound like American English, but then, you know, like Indian parents, a lot of them, if they grow up in India, learn British English because that whole education system I always is tease, taught that way. I always tease people that, especially Americans, because they, the Americans do have a uh, superiority complex about the English language, but I always tease them about um, that I have the Queen's English, now the King's English, because I was born and raised in Nigeria, grew up in Jamaica, both English commonwealths, and the education system is English by design. And so when I pronounce certain words, they're like, no, that's not what it is. I'm like, that's actually exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. What was the transition like for you from England to here growing up? I mean, I honestly, I was so young. I feel like for me, it didn't really matter i you know it's funny i never asked my parents that that's true their their perspective must be very very interesting right so india to the uk to america and america and it's it's not enough to say america so many different parts of america right are, are, is they're just different the south is different from the east different from the west i'm curious to say to, i'm curious to see what they would i'm curious to hear what they would uh how they would kind of log all of that yeah, I wondered that too. And you know, it's funny because until we talked about this, I never thought, I never thought of asking them, you, you know, I'm like, it must've been a big transition. Yeah. Right. What was the, do you, do you know what the biggest thing, the biggest thing that stood out to you between England and say California, for instance, Detroit is, whew, that's a hard transition. Uh, Cause I, as long as I've known Detroit, or at least that area of Michigan, it hasn't been the kindest of areas. We, we, does that fall in, especially compared to California? It depends on which part of California you're in. But what, what was that transition like? Say Kent to Detroit, for instance. Yeah, I feel like, you know, 
Detroit is such an interesting place. It's such an, in my opinion, a very iconic American city, yeah, right? That fell city. into a lot of economic struggles, which is very complicated. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting. It is, has one of like the largest Middle Eastern diasporas mm -hmm. in the country, um, oh. is in like the metro Detroit area. So I think maybe for them that transition was a little, maybe not as difficult, I'd have to ask them. I think moving to Morgantown, West Virginia, even as a child of color, I definitely like felt that we were outsiders, mm. if that makes sense. And not because the kids we played with or anything like that were really, you know, racist or like, oh, you know. Mm -hmm. But I remember distinctly, and it's so hard to admit this as an adult, <laughs> I, you know, your school age, you're in elementary school. All you really want to do is fit in, right? Yeah. All the insecurities of youth are there that we all have. And I remember distinctly being like, I wish I were white, mm. you know, which I want to go back as an adult and go to my younger self and just say, like, what are you thinking? Like, be so proud of who you are and your culture. But, you know, you're just like this young kid that's living in this space and you feel like I'm the different one, right? Right, right. And it's really customary in our families and cultural traditions for your, for the son's parents to live with you in like multi multi generational household, right, right? right? So we grew up with my dad's parents, um, Dada and Dadi. That means paternal grandmother and grandfather, mm. and that's very customary. And my grandparents, you know, I mean it that was the only way it was going to happen. Both my parents were working so much. My mom was a resident, you know, my grandparents took us to school. My grandpa, you know, helped us with our homework. He used to give us extra homework. I remember this distinct, uh, I always think about this with him. You know, when you sharpen pencils, he yeah, used yeah, to yeah. sharpen pencils with like a razor with a razor. Yeah. yeah instead of a pencil sharpener. Yeah. But the only reason I ever learned how to speak Punjabi or anything like that was because of my grandparents. That's awesome. Because in our house, we, we've always spoken English. And, but they wore traditional clothes, right? Like my grandma wore traditional clothes. My grandpa had a turban. You know, it felt like very different than everybody else. And so I remember just being so insecure about that as a mm. child. And I mean, you know, there's nothing you can do about it now. But I, you know, I'm like, I wish I had that foresight maybe that's but, normal I think. yeah I th growing up it's even the transition um, from for me the transition from nigeria to jamaica jamaica surprisingly has a very strong um nigerian community so it's one of those things where you can leave home and still find home very easily and if you go to school school then the, that, that culture shift, that culture jarring shift is much more obvious. So when you go to school, you are quite visibly different. Even amongst Jamaicans, I was obviously oh, that's interesting. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was obviously not Jamaican. I mean, the way I spoke, the way I dressed, the way I um, behaved was just unique. It was different for them, for sure. So I, me and my brothers, we all stood out in that kind of way. And... Jamaica has patois, right? So that's the that's the the local language, if you will, and that's very different from me speaking English. In fact, it's it's so different that it's it's really cool for a kid to speak it, at least at the time. And I now as an adult, I'm I'm endeared to patois. I love it. I I consider myself almost fully Nigerian and fully Jamaican. Uh, so much of who I am. That's amazing. Is, yeah, so much of who I am is both, but. Um, I remember wanting to be so Jamaican. I wanted to be all Jamaican. And how, looking back now, I, I can understand how that uh, dichotomy is it, challenging for a little kid growing up. Did you, did you feel the immigrant parent inertia to be a doctor? <laughs> you know, I probably did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And my response to that when I went to college was I'm not going to become a doctor. I'm like, I got to do something else in my life. I've got to expand my horizons. And it's so funny because I just came back around to it yeah. in not the way I expected. I, as a Latin major in college and a biology major, I thought I was going to go to grad school. I'm like, I'm going to study medieval Latin. 
when I started volunteering at clinic, shout out to the Berkeley Food Clinic, they did a lot of community work and I wasn't even working in a medical capacity. Mm -hmm. I worked at, um, in the information and resources collective. So people would call in, they needed a place to seek shelter for the night, find a clinic that they could get services at because we offered very limited services. And it just felt really amazing to do that kind of work. And I thought, you know, if I do this very academic position where I'm studying this very narrow but deep area of literature is really what I think you could could call it. Mm -hmm. I'm just never going to interact with people from all different walks of life, right? In a manner of speaking, right? Like I am immersed in this world that there's, there's not a lot of people that do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And there's probably not going to be (laughs) (laughs) realistically. Right. Um, and medicine is so appealing because you just, you meet so many different people and there's so many different experiences that, you know, you will never have in your life. Right. It, whether that's your coworkers, your patients, you know, people you work with, I think it's hard to find that in a lot of professions. I, I was, I think I was talking to uh, Dr. Brown, Shalay Brown, um, our colleague, that perhaps in medicine, because we say medicine, but really it's, it's uh, there's so many different careers in medicine. That's fair. And yeah. there is there is room for everyone in medicine. So. I could I could make the case I, I in my medical school class, people from all sorts of backgrounds, pr- their prior lives to medicine, who wanted to become doctors, who wanted to become medical doctors, accountants, NFL football players, um, just everybody was there. Everybody, everybody who ended up wanting to be a physician was available there. And I don't know many other careers uh, or fields of occupation can boast that kind of diversity. I'm not sure I can think of any off the top of my head where different attributes can manifest itself in a way in a medical career. So I'm truly, truly um, thankful for that experience because I also felt that I did not want to do medicine. My mom is a doctor. My dad is a pharmacist. And I I always felt that I was pushed into it. And it's funny, my, my senior year in college, I, I told my parents, nah, I'm not going to do this. I'm good. Um, I was going to just stop. And I was going to do biomedical engineering. I was still in the biological sciences. but And kind of like you, I kind of just found my way. I went and uh, worked at Shaber Medical Center. That's where I worked before I went to medical school. Met residents and interacted. People that I worked with were generally interested in me and they're like oh wow like if you are interested in medicine in medicine you should probably you know shadow these people so at work they'll be like hey hey they're doing the bone marrow biopsy why don't you go watch it and i end up matching there for residency but i thought that was really that experience gave me my own internal like oh this is for me i think i can do this um and i I've, i made every other decision for medicine based off of kind of that feeling of, well, I bought myself more time with internal medicine. I knew I couldn't do so many, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I couldn't do so many other things. I bought myself some more time with internal medicine. And then um, really critical care was a, felt like the, where I belonged. And pulmonary is something I'm growing to love now um, through fellowship and into, into working. How did you get to say I am internal medicine and then Palm so I always thought how we have to learn and be able to treat as much about our patients as we can. Mm. And so I felt, okay, I've got to go into internal medicine, like being able to take care of all the systems. Mm-hmm. And then I felt, you know, the ICU is interesting. It is on the one hand, incredibly stimulating, right? I think a lot of us enjoy the moments of adrenaline, but I have come to find that my favorite moments are things like end of life, right? Mm. Like you are gifted this opportunity to be with someone in such a vulnerable moment. I mean, it's really incredible if you mm-hmm. think about it. And I think sometimes it's a little bit different than even then the, in the ER because we get to establish almost a longitudinal relationship, right? And I mean, that might mean days. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's weeks, right? 
with people and we just get this different window into their lives, their family that comes to visit, you know, I think as a provider or as a person, I take a step back and say that it's challenging in, in ways I didn't anticipate. Right. I thought as I, I guess, grew up through medicine, going to medical school, going to residency and just grew up as a person and matured sort of into what I feel like is adulthood, which for me is, was like, 30 and older. <laughs> I feel like I really I solidify who I am as a person. Yeah. You know, I thought so much of this is more than just the actual mechanics of the medicine, right? Like this is about making a human connection. And I think a lot like, is that teachable? Is that something that we just learn as we go through life? And then another piece of it is I think recognizing like how much space that we can all individually take up. Right. Like a lot of times we are not the same race as our patients. We don't mm. understand the struggles they've been through. Um, we certainly a lot of times can be more educated or have the privilege of education. Mm -hmm. Right. The socioeconomics, everything. Right. Like how much space do we take up in a room when we don't when we haven't walked in someone's shoes. Right. And I like that's challenging. Right. To have that self reflection and editing and saying like, you know, how do I have a connection with somebody in this moment? And what are things that could be barriers, right? That I don't even realize. What are my biases? And I think that's the great part of, in general, human interactions. Do you think that's your, that's one of, if not the most uh, important driving factor for your affinity for what you do right now is that human connection that you develop with your patients? Yeah, I think so. You know, and I, and, I don't ma want this to sound hubristic, but I think like the the compendium of medical knowledge can be learned, right? Yes. It's something that takes a long time to master, yeah. but it's something that can be learned, right? I think all of the other things on top of that are really where it's beautiful and challenging yeah. at the same time. I, yeah, I think, so again, I'll, I'll go back to, the previous uh, guest, Dr. Brown, her and I were talking about, she brought up end-of-life care and how much that means to her as well. And that being a, a, an opportunity that she, she takes it as a privilege as well to be in that space with people in their most vulnerable state. And that's, that's the patient and their family members. So I, human connection, the way we... The way we interact with our patients, it's both um, respective of our role from a socioeconomic or race or or any other factor. It's very humbling, right? So like so many of our patients teach us so much about ourselves. Yeah. Right. And it's 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 never intentional. And it's not something you go into. You never walk into a patient's room with intention of I'm going to learn more about myself in this interaction or this like you said, this longitudinal interaction over time. I'm going to learn more about myself. I did not know I was capable of tearing up for random strangers. And let's be honest, that's what, that's what they are. At least they're very random. There's no rhyme or reason as to who we get into our, that comes into our lives. They're random in that way and they're random in how little time we get to spend, spend with them. Right. But they have such emotional impact. There's some of them that have... Some of them, they're, they're patients that you'll never forget. And they have such deep emotional impacts and affect you and how you practice moving forward. So I've always appreciated that as well. I do wonder if there are, if there is a, a cost to that. Like, is there, can you get jaded from being so emotionally invested? And I wonder if that takes a toll down the line. We're, we're both relatively young physicians, not relatively, we are young physicians in, dare I say, age and experience. I do wonder if, let's say two decades from now, if we're still doing this, do we feel the same way? I'm, I'll, I'll be curious to talk to some older um, physicians to see where that perspective would be. What do you think? Yeah, I, you know, my first initial thought while you were saying that is I suppose, you know, people go into medicine for lots of reasons mm -hmm. and there's different motivations. And I don't know if there's certain motivations that would burn you out faster, mm. you know, from that 
empathetic connect, like trying to build these connections over time. I don't know. You know, I've thought about it because sometimes in these really sad situations, I won't cry even though I feel the sadness and other times I'll just be tearing up. Right. right? And I think, is this like, am I crying in patient five's room because patient one through four, like it took patient one through four to like finally wow. like pull it, the actual tears out of me, even though like I felt the sadness. Right. And I don't know, I guess I haven't really, you know, in some ways emotions are, they're not rational, right? They're just things you feel. It's, I don't it's, know. It's such a strange experience. And I'm, I'm thinking about it now. I've, I've certainly been in, in the span of say 30 to 45 minutes, been in a room with a, a patient that's passing away and completely being in the moment for those experiences, walk out and go get some coffee. Right. And that, th those emotions, those, 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 uh, injuries, th those, th that, that challenge doesn't carry itself with me to the coffee. Like I, I do wonder if that if that is a good <laughs> defense mechanism. So when I walk out of the room and I go down to PJs and get me some coffee, um, I'm by the time I get to PJs, I may not be thinking about the experience anymore. Though in that very moment, I was very much there, and I had never, I don't know anywhere else in my personal life where I have that kind of reaction to strong emotions like that. Um, I'm. I, and I don't know when I developed it. Obviously, I think being in medicine kind of exposes you to that so often that perhaps it is a defense mechanism to whew, sadness. Uh, and it's not just your sadness. It's, it's not just one person's sadness. It tends to be an entire family's worth of, of, of sadness. And it's strange. Like I said, it's strange because you're feeling this way for strangers but they all look to you in a way that you'd look to someone for guidance. So, and how many people in your personal life do you look to, do you look to for guidance that aren't uh, familiar? Yeah, that's so true. And yeah. I mean, I think that's why this probably might not be the most popular opinion, mm -hmm. but I think you should feel the weight of that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I had an attending in fellowship who would tell patients that we are so honored to take care of your loved one, that you've trusted us mm. to take care of someone you love and care about. I feel like we have to feel that responsibility. I think that's the only way to get catharsis at the end of it, you know? Is to, is to embrace that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what has the transition been? You brought our fellowship. What has that trans? And it's only been what a week, not a week, a month or so. What has that transition been like? So fellow, you've, I mean, you've been in training for at least a third of your life, it feels like. What, and it's only been a month now, but or a month and some change. What has that transition been like for you? I can barely contain my excitement. It's been so great. <laughs> you know, awesome. it, it's intimidating. I'm not going to lie. But beneath all the excitement mm -hmm. is intimidation because, you know, you feel that responsibility is now on your shoulders mm -hmm. alone, right? And you want to take care of people in a way that does right by them, the people that they love, but it feels really good. It really made me think that like, happiness is probably the intersection of circumstance and choice, mm, you know, and I like that. it feels great to be at the end of the journey and exciting to open a new chapter. I think that circumstance was a bigger positive transition than I thought it was going to be. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Did you have a, a moment of catharsis where you were like, wow, I'm actually done. I'm, I'm finally done. Do you feel like you're finally done? Because I, I, I have a few friends, um, I'm thinking of one in particular, who he doesn't, he's working as an attending and he still feels like there's, there's more yet to come um, and that attendingship wasn't didn't feel he didn't get the catharsis that I I would say that I got when I was done with fellowship. He didn't he didn't get that. Have you had that moment where you're like, like, I've 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 reached the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I definitely felt that. Really, I really did. I felt 
I think we, you know, we've talked about this. It was the final graduation, mm. right? And as humans, you know, we enjoy ceremony and ritual. A lot of us do. And it, this one felt really special and yeah. different, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, I, med school didn't do it. Resi- yeah. Residency didn't do it. Fellowship for sure. Fellowship for sure. It felt did. great. Yeah. yeah. And, and knowing that I did not want to do any more. Right. <laughs> You're like, this is it. I'm this done. This is it. I, I have no. nothing else that I want to. More power to the people that can keep on Bless keeping them. on with it. You Bless know? Them. Bless Yeah. Them. I was ready. At you, the end. you and I have spoken about um, your love and affinity for the Latin um, folks or the Latin community. The classics. The classics. Yeah. Um, so beyond medicine, you and I spoke about this in, in, you know, in the past about if you couldn't do medicine, you would probably go back into that kind of world. Do you now that you're kind of, you know, b- becoming your own self, right? Becoming your own practitioner, your own attending, your own physician. And you're, it, it also feels, I think, an unsaid part about being an attending is you get a better grasp of your life outside of medicine right so you you now you have time that you can create your own time now right maybe it's a it's a bias because of where we work i I would make the case that we have a, a framework that allows us a lot the time to do so but i i don't think training gives you that consistency of time where you can kind of fine tune yourself in a mm-hmm. way that most of our colleagues have done years ago that we are now just oh yeah yeah I, I make the case that i am still as an adult i'm still in my 20s from because i'm doing things now that i should have been doing in my 20s <laughs> right i think about that a lot right yeah. so I, i'm just catching up to a lot of my colleagues uh so i'm i'm about 10 years behind on so many of life experiences and um things that you kind of pick up in your 20s that i was not able to pick up i'm picking up now um what would be your what's your what's your outside of medicine thing that you that you would do now and to kind of keep fine tuning yourself and becoming the person that you're so proud of like right now i think you know i literally was talking to sarah about this yesterday and i really want to take adult piano lessons i love it i love music she was like, if there was a skill that you could acquire, and I'm like, playing a musical instrument would be amazing. I think it's something you can take with you. It's something you can share with others. Mm-hmm. You can bring joy to people with music. That would be probably it. And you're right. Now we finally have time. I love it. I think, so piano and not say, why piano and not say guitar or violin or anything else? I don't know. I think it's the... To me, it's always been the instrument, mm. right? I don't, you, it's so versatile. It's so physical. I guess all instruments are, but yeah, I just, you know, I was like, I should learn the piano. I played clarinet for years growing mm. up. So I was like, you know, something different, something that I'd love to like sit in a hotel lobby and make somebody happy, you know, by playing or being able to do that. There's a piano in the, in the hospital lobby. I think every, does every hospital have a... I feel like, yeah. Yeah, I think every hospital, mm-hmm. there's your obligatory piano that has the thing around it that no one should go play it, play by it. But we have one at work, and sometimes I go sit by it. But it's automatic. Is that what you say for pianos? When when it's like, it just plays music yeah, with nobody to like play it? it. Maybe, An yeah. auto piano. An auto piano, yeah. yeah. So it's auto, it's right by the front. And sometimes I sit by there and I oh, man, I wish I could play right? that song. That's awesome. So piano, we are you gonna do it? Well, yeah, I was actually driving by the guitar sh- uh, shop, yeah. and I thought, I wonder if they offer piano lessons or if they know somebody that does. Like, I have a week off, you know. I should pick it up, enrich myself somehow. Have you ever played at all? Oh my gosh, no, not, not really. Like maybe a couple lessons when I was a kid. About we could go back to medicine now. I'm thinking of. I thought about your mom. Is she still practicing? She is. Wow. Yeah. Wow. She was in solo practice for a long time and then started working for the VA a couple years ago and really loves it because it's a little 
slower pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is your dad in medicine as well? Mm -hmm. He's a family practice doc. He wow. still works too. I, I I don't think that age, and we've we've had this conversation as well. I don't think that age group know how to phase out of medicine. The doctor is the identity. Like yeah, <laughs> identity number one. Yeah, identity For number sure. one is doctor. Yeah. Whereas I would make the case that I think I would put so many other things before doctor comes. If someone was to describe me, I would pr probably put physician, doctor as fifth on the list. Um, husband, dad, all that stuff comes first. Brother, son, all that stuff uh, probably comes first for me. Do you, do you have any particular tier as to where you would put physician in your identity kind of framework? You know, I don't think I've thought about organizing it that way, but I hate to say it as time has gone on, it's <laughs> definitely been climbing the ranks. Oh, I, you know, I remember one day in college, I was literally sitting in the middle of a midterm, it's like genetics or mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. And I got up in the middle of the test and just walked out. Because I thought to myself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for me? Is this going to make me happy? Like, what am I doing here in this seat, in this lecture hall, taking this test right now about genetics? And it really made me think you can't, maybe it's a psychological protective mechanism. You mm -hmm. can't put all of your happiness eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Because at any given point in your life, there's going to be times when your home life is stressful. There's going to be times when your work is stressful when being a dad or being a son or That's being true. a brother or being, you know, it's going to be stressful or being a friend is mm -hmm. right. Where you really have to expend a lot of energy, emotional energy or other things to say, help a friend who needs you in that moment. And it's nice when all the other things in your life are enriching you. Cause I think that prepares you to deal with those challenges the best way you can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's beautifully said. That's beautiful to say. I guess truly then that list then is, it fluctuates depending on that particular Yeah, I moment. think so. Yeah, that's fair. But I it's so that. exciting right now that, you know, I think about if I weren't doing my job right now, I'm like, what would I do right now? But, you know, you, you'd find something, right? I think most of us will. Like, the human spirit is very resilient. Yeah, yeah. What would I do? I think I said I would be a pilot if I... Yeah, you did say that. Yeah, and then, and then... Um, sadly, two days ago. So every time I think about becoming a pilot, which is like once every three months, I'm like, yeah, I should, I should go to pilot in school. Something deters me from that. So literally three days ago, a congressman from, um, I forget which state, he's a, a self-pilot. So he, he, he flies his plane with his family and they just, they crashed and passed oh away. Oh that, That's tragic. That is tragic. And whenever, <sighs> like, and then I, I read that and I was like, yep, that's why I'm not going to, <laughs> that is why I'm not going to become a pilot. Because I can't imagine flying and not flying with my wife or my kids. Like I would, that's what I would want to do. That's right. What, it's kind of the reason I want to do it. So I guess I'll just keep, keep, skip, uh, keep up with Breeze and Spirit Airways for now. Um, travels. Where have you been recently? I just came back from the Philippines. How was that? What an incredible experience. How long were you there for? Three weeks. Wow. Yeah. I would say, you know, my favorite, oh gosh, it's hard to say what my favorite part was, but I went with a, a childhood friend of mine mm. and her family is from this place called Bobom in Northern Samar. And like what an incredible experience, right? To visit someone's family home and oh. to stay in that home, in that space, uh, Oh my gosh. I mean, it was. So it wasn't, it wasn't a trip the way we think of trips, right? So it's, it's like, it's more akin to going to stay at your friend's house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it was just really beautiful because she came with me to India when we went out to the village. That's, That's where amazing. my dad's from, right? Is like rural India. Right, right, right. And you know, that kind of provincial life is just something that most of us city dwelling or our suburb dwelling folk here, you know, you don't experience that very often. And it was just so incredible to go really immerse myself in her family. Who's so incredible. So welcoming to eat all the foods, to experience all the things, go to the fair, the local fair, you know, just all of the, these places that I would never go do that experience right, right. otherwise. 
Um, so I will forever be grateful that the first week I spent doing that. And then the last two weeks were just a lot of traveling, diving, incredible diving. I mean, it just was amazing. I don't think I ever thought of the Philippines as a diving place. Um, but now that I think about it, it's a, it's, it's a group of islands. It's a bunch yeah, of islands. Yeah, it's many islands. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's bunch amazing. of islands. So it certainly will have, I'm sure, it will have some diving spots. Um, I love experiences like the village life, the way I would think about it. Because it, it makes it so obvious that happiness really is a, uh, it comes from inside, right? So I, every time I think about the village, I think about how, so much of what peppers our lives right now and we think make us happy actually adds to the, to the distraction and to the illusion. And all, all we really want is some good food. <laughs> <laughs> good and, food and good times. Yeah, good food, yeah. good times and good company. That's really mm-hmm. all we want. It's just some good food, some good times and some good company. Um, I think that gets lost so much in, 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 in modern society, whatever for whatever that may mean, um, is there anywhere you, any place you're looking forward to going next? Oh my goodness! If I if I won the lottery, I would go to the Galapagos tomorrow. Really? Yeah, go see all the turtles <laughs> and all the other animals <laughs> and the beautiful diving that's there. You know, you love diving. It sounds like how long have you been diving? Not that long, probably about a year. Oh. But you know what? Part of it is is just. I feel like climate change is taking away a lot from the oceans. And I keep telling myself, you know, better go see it while you can. Yeah. Do you dive? I do not. Not the way you dive. Probably not. I've, I've done, um, (laughs) snorkeling. (laughs) Is that the same? (laughs) Not exactly, but can be very fun. So in, in the Cayman Islands, my mom lives in the Cayman Islands. They have a, a like a nice little mix between like the diving that I'm sure you are more accustomed to and snorkeling, which is just like, you know, staying on the surface. So they, they connect you to a tube that allows you to go several feet down. And it, that was, that's always been a, such a great experience for me. I wish, did you do like, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you did like formal dry, diving classes mm-hmm. and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, you can do it here in Metairie. Really? Mm-hmm. Is that where you did it? Mm-hmm. If you said this in the last year? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's, uh, you know, classroom education and then practical. Yeah, 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 yeah. How long did it take you? Two weekends. That's it? Yeah. And then you got to go like do an open water certification where, you know, you go out somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, you can actually do it anywhere. I flew to Miami and to, did it there. Ex- yeah. Anywhere in the world or anywhere in the country? Anywhere in the world. I'll just go home. Yeah, you should totally do it there. Maybe I'll do that instead of get my pilot's license, become a yeah, diver. Yeah, diving's amazing. So in it the comes last with some year, risks, but you know. Sure, but you know it's not. Yeah, so you do the whole, uh, you know, hold your breath or nitrogen. You gotta what is it? Nitrogen. Um, when the bu- when the air causes you the the bends. The bends. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be careful. But they teach you how to how to manage all of that and what the risks are and how to mitigate the risks, you know. And and like most things, activities, if you're prepared and take precautions. Right. I have that uh, paranoia about, at least I've read a few stories about people being confused to, in such a way that is detrimental to their dive or their dive partner or something like that. Yeah, if you go deep enough, uh, you can get nitrogen narcosis, yeah. right? Yeah. This higher continent content of nitrogen dissolves. What's the deepest you've ever been? Do you have a recollection? Of it? Uh, no, I'm going to tell you 30 meters. How, what's that in? Is that pretty no, deep? No, I'm sorry. We did a deep dive. Yeah. I, so you, if you get, just do your open water certification, uh-huh. which is, I'm going to go diving. Mm-hmm. There's a certain depth limit mm. that you go to. Because once you start getting deeper, things get stranger. I can imagine. <laughs> and you just have to take different precautions and be aware of different things like nitrogen narcosis. Mm. And you can't stay down the deeper you go. If you're just using regular compressed air, yeah. you can't stay as long down there. Wow. Yeah. So since you got your certification, where, where, where all have you, you know, dove or let's see, we did Miami Devon. and 
in Mexico, Dovis cenote, two cenotes, and also like a national park, but water like mm-hmm, in there, mm-hmm. and then in the Philippines. The Philippines being the most recent one. Yeah, where we we did a lot. We did like twelve dives. Is is diving the main reason you'd go to the Galapagos? Yeah, and I think it'd be and, so fascinating. And the fauna. Yeah, you know, to see the finches and the turtles and you know. Where Darwin really came up Dar- with the Darwin's theory. Finch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was in the Galapagos, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Wow. Where would you go next? That's a really good question. I would probably go... Where have I not been that I really want to be, that I'd love to go? New Zealand. Oh, good choice. Yeah, I've never been there either. New Zealand. And because I think... One, I don't want to go to Australia. I think Australia is a man death trap. Death trap. Every animal there is humongous per- and perfectly designed to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. What, I mean, what they call spiders are not spiders. I know. Yeah. What they call snakes are not snakes. I saw a video um, a few weeks ago of a snake on top of people's. Um, I, I, not a snake. Our, our giganto boa, like a huge, just going across people's uh, uh, roofs. Just lolly <laughs> gagging. It doesn't make any sense. I know. I, that is Australia. That is what Australia it, it, it the, the island continent is designed for human extinction. Why, <laughs> why there is any sort of um, settlement in Australia, it, it baffles me. I, 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 can, I confidently can say I will not ever be there. I'm so terrified. I, I, Australian stories. People open up their toilets and their snakes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they open up the bonnet of their car and their... And maybe I, 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 I'm saying snakes, but because I'm mortally terrified of snakes. It's, it's the on, they are the only thing that I'm afraid of on this planet. But they have some of the most poisonous and biggest and fastest. And whatever adjective you want to describe a snake with, Australia has it. So, that, I mean, that's all I need to know. New Zealand is close, close enough. Beautiful topography. That's where they film Lord of the Rings. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, beautiful, beautiful landscape with less, much less, uh, you know, human killing creatures, at least the way I understand it. Yeah, I mean, if you have a spider that's big enough in your house that so you can't kill it with a shoe. You're in the wrong house or country. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the wrong house I'm like, what country. would you even do? I would never sleep. I, how could you sleep? <laughs> well, how did, one, there's so many questions. How did the spider get there? Yeah, into your from house. Where? And this so is what big. people are finding in their house. Big old spiders. There's a video, and it sounds like I'm obsessed about Australian animals, and I might be, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of me remembering, hey, don't go to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a video of someone whose drywall was beginning to like break. It was in the ceiling, and it was like a, the, the tail of a snake was just hanging off <laughs> from the drywall. And <laughs> It breaks down and it's a snake's nest in the roof. <laughs> this is Australia. <laughs> this what is, do you even do when, you're, is, when you're in there? Like? This is Australia. This is what this oh is. And that's God. just Tuesday in Australia. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, ha- I don't have the braveness, the courage. Because that's, that's, if you live in Australia, that's what's required. You're, yeah. You, I mean, those are some brave people. You have to they be. They are. Brave. Yeah, how do you look at that situation? And first of all, pick up a video to record it. You should be leaving. But why are you here <laughs> recording the exit. video? Stop <laughs> recording. Get out. That's not your house anymore. That is the snakes. That's their, <laughs> that's their village. Like, let them be. So, yeah. So, New Zealand, because I want that exp- I want to see New Zealand. And Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah. And so, it's one of those things where I'd love to, like, not, not walk where Aragon walked. But, you know. Just yeah, you'd be doing that for, like, two months. Oh, if yeah. You went. I know. I know. Um. But yeah, I think definitely New Zealand. I want to go to England. Um, my favorite football team is there, Liverpool. So I'd love to go to Anfield and go to Liverpool. That's definitely a dream of mine. And I think perhaps what supersedes all of that is that I'd love to go back home to Nigeria, to oh, the village. Yeah. yeah, I haven't been back in many, many, many years. So probably the first trip that I'll take in the next few months outside of the United States will prob- almost certainly be to Nigeria to go visit my village and have a good time there. 
Yeah. How often do you go back home to, of course, that's, that's a strange question, but how often do you go back to India is probably the best, best way to ask that. You know, we used to go pretty frequently before the pandemic, mm. like every couple of years, which was great. Yeah. You know, and it's such a big country that is very diverse. So you can go and see so many different parts of the country and still have just scratched the surface yeah. of how amazing it, and historic and just how different different parts are. Yeah, I think the size of India in every way, so in demographic and culture and in, in, geog- in geography is, is understated. Um, the world map doesn't do it justice, that's for sure. So when was the last time you went? Was it before the pandemic? Yeah, I don't think I've gone since the pandemic. You know, part of it was just I feel like in fellowship it was tough. Yeah. It was tough to COVID. go with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of COVID, were you in fellowship for COVID? You were mostly in, in residency. Or a uh, bit of let's both? see, no, I graduated residency in 2020. So COVID had hit. I mean, when I was a senior resident mm. back when it was taking us days to get a positive COVID yeah, yeah, test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was, wow, what an experience. Yeah. I paradoxically find it harder to talk about it now than I did back then. How so? Why is that? You know, I was thinking about it earlier when we were talking about how, you know, you could leave a dying patient's room and go get a mm-hmm. cup of coffee. There's this book, and forgive me because I don't remember the author, um, The Body Keeps Score, Keeps mm. the Score. Uh, which talks about trauma and how you were like, there is like a impact that it leaves on you that you might not necessarily even perceive perceive. The first time I ever thought about it when my, a friend of mine had mentioned this book um, was when we had the COVID ICU at Oshner, Mm -hmm. it was a big ward on the 16th Mm -hmm. floor of the tower. Mm -hmm. And to this day, if I go up there and I stand outside the door, like I start sweating. Wow. And I never really, like I feel my heart racing and I never really like put it together. And I'm like, God, because every time I did come up here, it was, it was something awful, right? It was not ever good news. Like someone's calling you because something is going down. Yeah. And when I think about early days of COVID, I think a lot about like, the psychology of safety because you know, like all of us that worked in the hospital, people were, what is this? Are we going to get sick? Should we code these patients? Should we be doing all these things that are going to keep people in the room longer? It felt so strange because as, as a provider, you think, oh, I got to do something, something, right? And we got to keep taking care of people. But, you know, people that took care of kids, their own kids at home, took care of elderly parents, had all these other reasons, you know, I felt fortunate that I lived alone and, you know, I just came back and I'm like, okay, I'm not exposed, exposing anyone else in my home. Um, I like, yeah, I can see why people felt so unsafe and it was such palpable fear. I don't think I've ever experienced that, you know, and maybe I'm privileged as a person to have not experienced that kind of collective palpable fear that everyone had and then came to fellowship in July of 2020. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a bizarre time, and it, and one of the reasons I enjoy critical care is that on any given day, you get a positive reinforcement that you're doing the right thing, right? And I took a lot of that for granted prior to COVID. So it's what we would say is a simple DKA, right? You take that for granted. Oh, it's a DKA. Another mm-hmm. DKA is coming. In the middle of COVID, we would have, so we rotated between the VA, UMC, and um, Tulane. In the middle of COVID, it would, the entire critical care unit and the hospital at large was full of COVID patients. They were all identical, especially in the ICU. It's basically the same thing. The only thing that was different is, the the only heterogeneity was in time. So it was just temporary. It was this person came two days ago, eventually they're going to look like that person that's been here for the last three weeks. And that was harrowing. The feeling of nothing I'm doing is helping. Right. And anyone that came in, chances, chance, 
a high chance of them coming to the ICU is almost it, it's by almost at that at that time it felt like that was a death sentence. And it was it was a strange time for me because I I enjoy outside. I like I like to I'm a counter. Like I count things when I'm nervous and I count it a lot. And I, I became aware of my counting so much. Like I count steps like I know that this has 10 uh, panels on here because I've counted this a million times. Um, but things, thing, I, I count a lot. So what I meant in the middle of, I remember standing at the VA windows and standing outside and I was counting clouds. I was just counting clouds. I just needed something to count. So I was counting clouds. And I was like, wow, it's, <laughs> this is the most rainy season. This is normally a very rainy season but it's the most beautiful day outside. And it was a strange dichotomy for me that in New Orleans, where it's so hot and so, so wet at the same time, and so the, the weather outside was just magnificent, just beautiful. And in the ICU was just, just horror. And I remember just th- that really, really like jarred me for a little bit because I think that was what led to something like that led to the dissonance between how people felt because people felt there were polls where COVID was concerned. Is it real? Is it fake? Right. And that hurt me (laughs) because I'm like, (laughs) I'm looking behind me and their families are complete, are being destroyed by, by the dozens on a day to day basis. Right. Over and over and over again. And, and the idea that it, that it was, it became this polarizing topic was, it affected me in a way I didn't think I was capable, I didn't think I would care that much. Um, but COVID was a bizarre experience. It was, it was, uh, it made me appreciate the DKAs, you know, the, the, <laughs> hyper, the hypertensive emergencies, you know, the things that you know, you know, the COPD exacerbation. So I think even now, like I think about those, like all those patients, I'm just like, man, sure. I'm lucky. I got to take care of you today. (laughs) Right. And that people are, there are people that you can make better. Yeah. Yeah. And and I didn't think I went into, you know, the old cliche, um, uh, why are you in medicine? I want to save lives. And literally in COVID, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted, I just wanted to make someone feel better. And I didn't think, I always thought it was a cliche when people said that, and it is, right? In your medical school um, interview, why, why do you want to be a doctor? I want to save lives. But that felt the realest in the middle of COVID. Um, and I, I would say COVID took, what, two years out of my fellowship? Yeah, right. Like, yeah, the vast majority mm-hmm. of my fellowship was... was with COVID, yeah. Yeah, it was COVID. Um, so I guess I'm a COVID specialist. I felt weird about it all in the moment. And then the, it, it just kept on <laughs> yeah. happening. It just kept it on did. happening. It did. It never, it felt like it was never ending. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, you know, it's just in a lot of ways, because it was such a, I mean, really a couple years, right? Mm-hmm. This longitudinal look back on it, there were so many, in my mind, so many distinct phases of it, like mm-hmm. that initial fear. I think people in the medical community, at least from my experience, people I worked with in my co-residents, people all responded dif- differently, mm-hmm, right? And mm-hmm. I definitely think about it differently now. Like I remember when COVID first hit, I'm a person living alone at home. I don't have any other responsibilities other really than to myself. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, this is our mantle, right? This is, we've chosen to do this job and we have to do it. This is our time. Yeah, even if it costs us whatever, you know, maybe our own lives, we don't know. And I used to think what, like, that's the way that I have to do this to get through. And I to see, like, the different spectrums of how people thought about work, right? And, like, what is worth it, right? Is it worth it to go do this? Well, we have no idea. We're not saving anybody, right? Realistically in the beginning, we weren't saving many people Mm -hmm. to then get exposed and go home and give it to your child, give it to your mom, give it, you know, like all of those factors you don't even think about because we've never been challenged in that way, right? To, to make those kinds of decisions and to have that rubric in our mind of this is worth it, or this is what I'm going to do for this job. 
Do you or feel not. that way now? Do you still feel that way now? I feel like overall I do. I always, I always wonder, I'm like, if I had kids, would I feel differently? Mm. You know, like if I had other people that were really, truly relying on me, right? Would I feel differently about like, what do I need to do? Like, who do I need to be for them? Right, right, do right. I need to be the doctor first or do I need to be the parent or the sibling or what first? Right. It goes back to our yeah. conversation about identities and where at different times things occupy that hierarchy. Yeah. But I think, you know, a lot of people got burnt out of healthcare and part of it is I think the last phase of it was tough, right? It was hard to take care of people that really hated you at times, yeah, yeah. right? And I have a, a, one of our great ICU nurses told me, you know, I started to hate people wow. after COVID, which is such a profound thing to say for somebody who, you know, historically up until that point really loved, it. loved that job. You know, yeah, COVID, I think, exposed so much about our society. Um, it exposed so many things that were just standing on, on on loose grounds. I think even the medical community would admit that we we strayed away from the scientific method, I felt like. like I remember, we did, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which we shouldn't have. We should have never. I mean, that's that's our... That's our evidence base. That's what we're, that's what we're for. I remember thinking about how, like, some guy published a an article, and it was in a Word document in France, and actually it was the Plaquenil. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, wasn't this yeah. the Plaquenil? Yeah, this is the yeah. Plaquenil mm -hmm. uh, when we're using Plaquenil. It was a Word document with six patients. You know, in no other time would we be like, yeah, this is legit. Let's do it. Right. But I think we, we all got caught up in such a frenzy about what this was doing to the world at large and to people at, on a personal level that we, we kind of and it, we were scared. I think that's that's an honest feeling. I was terrified. And especially when we're so used to answering questions, at least our, most of the questions we can answer that our patients pose to us. And I don't know was so common. around. Oh, COVID. yeah. I, yeah. I just don't, I don't know. I know I people feeling know. like, are you giving, are you experimenting on me? And I think mm. that unfortunately, I mean, one thing that COVID exposed what has already been true in society for so long is how health disparity really affects people. Absolutely. Right. And I mean, it was just one more thing on top of how much, so much of society has just been underserved historically for so many reasons. Right. And that just came back to the forefront and it's, yeah, it's tough. You know, I don't think that is an unreasonable question to ask your doctor. Are you just experimenting on me? I'm mm. like, it's not so long ago in American medical history that, that the was, answer was yes. Yeah. Right. Like we don't know how we're helping you. We might not be helping you. Right. So I think that there, it, w it was tough because like you said, there was a lot of I don't know, and there was a lot of just isolation. So many patients died in the hospital without their families, yeah, right? That, that was that was definitely one of the hardest parts. I I, I have distinct uh, recollection, distinct memory of so many of these patients that, like you said, passed away with. It's not that they didn't have loved ones, which is a different thing, right? It, it they have the loved ones and them in abundance. But they weren't there. They couldn't be there for them. And I, I don't know what I don't know how we could have done things differently. And I don't think I've given it enough thought. And probably by on purpose, I haven't given this too much thought because then it, it might make me feel as if I was complicit, and you know, in in how we managed um, our patients and their families. Um. But yeah, I think. I, I, right now I'm thinking about a family that lost a, so two, two girls, 21 and 18 at the time, lost mom and dad. And in the space of a, of a month, right? Mom and dad in the space of a month. And not, not in the way that it, it was almost, what would you prefer, a heart attack or, to, or the way people are dying with COVID, right? So like heart attack, at least you're just like, they're not suffering. It kind of just happened. You know, it just caught up to them. But COVID was so random and so prolonged. The suffering of COVID was so long. Was yeah. So long. 
Um, I mean, it's weeks, months sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially at the beginning when you knew how this was going to end. So then the suffering made it much more suffering, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. At moral injury. To talk to think about COVID, it's uh, it was a weird. It's a hu- it was a huge moral injury. Yeah. We have not, I think, as a medical community, like, processed the trauma of COVID. And I don't think we'll ever get to. We maybe. probably won't. We don't. Yeah. We, we we we'll never be able to. And it, like you said, so many people left medicine because of all of the different ways that COVID impacted us. Right. Um. I, I, we're not going to have the time, no, nor the space, or the the time, space, or resource to dive into our personal. I, I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday about therapy, and I I will probably at some point engage myself in some kind of personal therapy, just kind of flesh out some of those feelings, and because it felt like disappointment, um, like sadness that I never really got to address, because. COVID kind of just went away. <laughs> <laughs> It'll evaporate. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, like, it's oh, just okay. like, oh, I mean, I guess. When did the pandemic end? Like, know, right. It, like, when, Good question. <laughs> when did the pandemic end? When did we... Is it ending or has it, it ended? Ending? Has yeah. it ended? Like, when did that happen? So, um, oh, and we moved on. Yeah, or we moved on. Or we just couldn't expend any more emotional, yeah. cognitive, psychological energy on it. So yeah. we're like, all right, it's COVID. Yeah. You know? And it's just COVID. Yeah. I mean, don't get me started with Ida. I mean, I just think about COVID and Ida together. And oh, that was like goodness. something How else. Could we? Yeah, Ida. Ida was... So I started my job here. With, That's with, right. Yeah, right, when started, Ida hit. right when yeah. Ida hit. Um, wow. Yeah. Crazy times. I completely forgot about Ida. You know, <laughs> it's funny though. Like I, I have all these moments that are coming back to me now. Yeah. You know, we were talking about this, right? When you look back on really difficult things. Like, I think we all have this psychological, I guess I could just speak from my perspective, this like psychological um, look back on things oh, to yeah. remember the positive things, mm-hmm. you know, in the moments. And maybe mm-hmm. that's just like the protective mechanism. So mm-hmm. you don't feel like you're just drowning in stacks of terrible memories. Um, but, you know, I just think about how many like silly, funny things that I had going on with, with people during that time. Yeah. Funny things happening during COVID. Oh, yeah. During I, Ida, I I, mean, I just remember we were, me and my co-fellow, we were working, but, you know, around the clock, we were in the hospital, we were activated, and I remember the storm hit, what, like 5, 6 p.m., right? And then it left, <laughs> and there's no phone service in the city, but somebody calls us, right? And the way that the phone works at Ashner as fellows is the outpatient calls after hours mm. come into that fellow phone, which is the phone that triages all the patients in the hospital. So, you know, when somebody calls that phone, you're waiting for catastrophe, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, we were so deep in, in our necks in COVID. And my co-fellow picks up the phone because we had double teamed during Ida. And a patient is asking, <laughs> it's constipated, and oh is asking for... <laughs> medicine and i walked out of the room so i started laughing i was like it's so you know it's like comedic relief after we've literally just been watching the hospital tower swing and she's like i don't think there's a pharmacy open in the city like there's no electricity sir. like sir. sir also don't be driving out on the streets Please for don't. some senna you know? I know. Like, yeah now is not the and time. i can never forget that phone call i remember just walking outside just laughing so hard and i was like i hope this patient doesn't hear me laughing but i'm like it's like it's, unreal yeah. like what we've all it's been uncanny. through perfect timing perfect timing yeah perfect time you couldn't you couldn't dream of a be, uh, of a better <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 ripped straight from the pages of the office yeah like the hospitals on well water and generator like it, this person's like you know and i'm like all right hey can i get some uh some lactulose or something i don't know that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a thing that's a thing. Um, we're also talking about look the way we look back at things uh, with a positive tint um, as a defense mechanism, probably, right? So I guess that's kind of, you're remembering that 
you know, that was something that stood out to you where all of the other craziness that had been going on. And of course, that, that, uh, that you know, provides the context to make it, make that patient's call right. funny. But yeah, I, I think definitely as part of our psychological defense mechanisms, you always think about how, you know, we learn. We, we do things because it teaches us stuff or life teaches us along the way. And you, you had said it beautifully a few days ago about how sometimes it just sucks. Like the experience itself, without justification of any positivity, maybe it just sucks. It was just a bad time. Um, is there any time in like medicine where, I, I, I wonder, is there any time in your training where you were just like, I mean, looking back now, you're like, I have no real, this, this experience from a clinical perspective or from training expected, uh, perspective, whether it be medical school, residency, fellowship, has no, and medicine, I think a lot of our training has a lot of these moments where it's just like, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Um, do you feel like you've had those moments as well where you're just like, why, what is the benefit? And looking back now, in hindsight, you feel justified for feeling that way. Yeah, I can think of the one time in my medical training that I started tearing up in the hospital mm. outside of like a patient encounter yeah, where yeah, yeah. I literally, and it was 2 a.m. and it was in the cardiac ICU at Henry Ford where there were ECMO patients, there were patients with LVADs, mm. there were patients with impellas all the and blue and plumps and all the things. And we used to do like 28 hour calls and, you know, after you go through a month of them, every four or five days during your 28 hour call, the fellow would come on fresh at 8 p.m. You had been there all day. And I remember it being 2 a.m. And he was like, we got around. <laughs> and I was, you know, you're getting called about all these things. You have no, you're like, I am so useless. Mm -hmm. Like You just feel that feeling of like, I'm just a body here that is fielding calls about the ECMO chugging. And I don't even know what that means, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like trying, you're like, I have no knowledge to troubleshoot these things and you're trying your best. And I remember he was like, let's round, meet me outside in five minutes. And I put my head down on the desk and I almost started crying because <laughs> I'm like, I'm, this is not worth it. Like I've been awake for so long and like, I'm so uh, useless, mm. right? Like I, I, I don't make the final decision on any of these things. I don't even, I'm not equipped knowledge wise and you feel that feeling of like defeat yeah. that you've let the patients down that you're letting the team down and i thought i'm so tired the fellow, I just the fellow should have been should have been a little bit more aware of that situation i mean i'm sure they know right he or she knew do you think they knew i don't know maybe they did i, sh I was really trying to keep it in and i'm like i need a private moment to just tear up and just, get up and, and go put, outside yeah. yeah yeah i do think it we tend to have um retrograde amnesia so where <laughs> the people below us so if you're a if you're a resident you're a medical student if you're a fellow you're a resident and then the different grades in those particular sectors or the particular stages of our training we forget that we were just there right? yeah we really do and and then we treat our uh colleagues so our subordinates i don't know if that's the right word but we treat them as if we didn't get here because we didn't know it then and we learned it and then i think that's one of the <laughs> it's a strange thing i see it happening all the time it's like you know like a a, a third year resident yelling at an intern like oh, you should know this like but I, did you i knew you <laughs> <laughs> as a first, as an intern, and you didn't know it. Uh, you should, how did you forget that? Like, how did you forget that you were just in those I shoes? Know. And medical training is so bizarre because if you, in, 
in one day, you go from one thing to another thing. You do. Isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah. In one day, there's no like real transition period. There's not. No one like walks you through it. Like yeah. there's some overlap. It's yeah. just that June 30th turns into July 1 and, and all of a sudden. You're, you're something you, else. You're something else. Completely, completely, completely with new, different. With yeah. new powers. <laughs> powers. <laughs> with yeah. brand new powers. You you just become this new upgraded version of, yeah. of, 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 you know, whatever we are. Our base form. <laughs> Of medical students, <laughs> <laughs> this new PGY. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, you're just accumulating superpowers as time goes on. Exactly. You know, it's wild. And literally, I remember my first year as a <laughs> as a fellow, and uh, the third year resident looks at me and is like, "Yo, this is two weeks in," and they're like, "Yo, <laughs> um, hey, can you help me with this?" And I'm like, "Hey, buddy, like, I'm you." <laughs> like we are together. <laughs> three weeks ago, <laughs> I was you. Three weeks ago. I don't know either. Like I need, I, I'm trying to figure this out as well. And it's so, there, there is no transition period. It just happens. You just this is yeah. who you are. You are now a fellow. You're now a second year. You're now a third year. Act accordingly. Right. Whatever that means. <laughs> whatever right? that whatever means. Whatever that means. Act, yeah. ac- act like you've been here before. So for, for the, the moment you become a fellow, you have to behave like a fellow. You whatever do, yeah. that means. Right. Um, and it's such a bizarre. Uh, I think the only way, the only place it doesn't happen is in going from fellow to attending, especially if you leave. Yeah, if you leave, uh, yeah, it doesn't feel that way. Where all of a sudden someone turned the light switch. Yeah, and I was like, okay, it's time to be whatever the attending is right, supposed right, to be. Right. Yeah, I think that's the, yeah. only, the only place that doesn't happen because I feel like most jobs kind of afford you the the that, that transition mm-hmm. you know they kind of ease you into it at least that's how it felt for me i didn't feel that jarring oh like except mm-hmm. whenever i saw my name on a patient's chart like oh my goodness that's me that's me yeah wow and it, it really is me this is my patient and only mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like there's no one standing yeah behind no your one, shoulder yeah. overlooking your work yeah yeah no one co-signs me your notes anymore but I feel like we in general have a lot of cognitive dissonance about training. You know, you talk to, we'll become, I feel like we're just going to evolve into that crotchety attending that says back in my day, I know, I know. we never slept. We slept in the <laughs> hospital, you know, and it's kind of unfortunate because I personally do think things need to change. There needs to be a reform in medical training, but like how quickly we forget. We, right? So quickly, so quickly. Well, I was talking to my my attending that was my previous guest, and he, you know, he was saying how when his because his dad was in medicine as well, and how, and even for him compared to us, so much of what has changed is for the good, but the the name of the game in medicine, especially where training is concerned, is to see as much as possible, right, and to gain that experience. Because I I would make the case that after medical school. The only thing that separates anyone else is time and experience and how much exposure you've had to different uh, presentations. So, um, and of course, you know, staying up to date and reading and all that stuff, but that, that comes, you know, without saying. And so his point was saying that like the reason there was some benefit to, you know, stay in the hospital for seven straight days, I'm exaggerating, but I probably am not is that you get to see so much. But I, my counter to that was, yeah, but after two days, you're not even human anymore. Right. Are you even <laughs> learning? Yeah. yeah. You're not no, learning. You're, you're on some zombie mode. And um, so finding a nice, delicate balance where you're, you're matching that experience to making it ma- meaningful experience and not just scut work just for the sake of it, just to work hard. It's one of my pet peeves is to work hard for oh, the, sake, the of sake of working hard. Oh, just the sake of working hard, yeah. yeah. Just to yeah. create a, a hard environment just for the sake of, you know, yeah, it makes you hard. Like, I don't, I don't like that at all. And I think a lot of medicine still is that way. Um, and that's how it was in the past. Did, did uh, and you, going back to your mom again, because she did neurosurgery, which is impressive in and of itself out of any, <laughs> any specialty, right? Um, did you have a sense of how challenging that was for her? Cause you, you must've been relative. How young were you when, when she was going through that seven years, right? Yeah, we did. We were like elementary school kids. Mm-hmm. 
No, you know, my mom is one of those people where someone could have died on the OR table and she'll come home and sit down and have dinner with you. You never would have known. And still be mom? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, when I think about, I mean, we obviously didn't see her a lot. Mm -hmm. I remember visiting her in the hospital and having like dinner in the cafeteria and the cafeteria folks were so nice. They knew us because we used to do it so often. Mm -hmm. And you know that smell? of like hospital scrubs and cleaning agents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is the smell that I really associate with my mom mm. because we used to see her so much, right? Or she'd come home and you can, I mean, it's probably on all of us now. We just don't even realize right, it. Right. But I like, that's my vision of her is in like the surgeon greens and like that smell of the hospital. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think, uh, this comes to the end of this enlightening <laughs> conversation, despite our little break. But thanks for coming through. We should do it again. Yeah, let's do it. What, Thank I you wonder, so much for having me. Of course. I wonder what we'll get into next time. And that's it. That's it for our show today. Thank you. <laughs> what do you think?